You know, I've been doing a series entitled, What the Preacher Won't Tell You. And uh, we're continuing that series right now. Before I do, I'm going to invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father, I want to thank you for this church, these people, the children's choir, the adult choir, for the leaders that give of their time and their effort. And Lord, we want to please you as we worship you. And now, Father, since you have blessed every phase of Sabbath school and church, please be with me now as I present your words so that when it's done, everyone will leave different and say, I heard Jesus, I saw Jesus. So Lord, bless to this end. Use me in spite of me and let the peace of heaven rest on this room. For I am sure that your enemy and our enemy is not pleased with this series, much less this presentation. So Lord, Push Satan and his evil spirits out and let us calm come upon us so our hearts and our minds will be open to hear and respond accordingly. And thank you for hearing this prayer because it's prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You know, in sermon... Do I know how to work this thing? Oh, I know. Thank you. I heard somebody say it. Turn it on. Oh, boy. It works when you do that. It works when you do that. Okay. You know what the preacher won't tell you? Part one was what the preacher won't tell you about the origin of the book of Daniel. Part two, which was last week was about the foundation of the book of Daniel. And I'll be carrying this a little farther today in part three. And remember, when we looked at the foundation of the whole rest of the book of Daniel, which is chapter two, the the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, we discovered that perhaps maybe it hasn't been pointed out to you, that the one aspect of that dream that was talked about the most was the feet of iron and clay. And I put it up there so you can see verse 33, 34, 41, 42, that's four times. But then in 41 again, 43, twice is the iron mixed with miry clay. This is what God wanted us to focus on as we set the stage now for the rest of the book of Daniel. And so... What the preacher won't tell you, part three, about the Antichrist of the book of Daniel. I want to show you what exactly we mean by the foundation last week as we enter into looking at the Antichrist. Remember, what the preacher won't tell you, this might startle some of you, and it may not. If you look at the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had in chapter number two and put it against the dream that Daniel had in chapter number seven, you will see the parallelism. You will see the head of gold, which stood for Babylon, and the king of beasts is the lion, that's Babylon. And the breast and arms of silver, uh, the bear, that's Medo Persia. And the uh, thighs of brass, that's Greece. The legs of iron, that is Rome. And notice it was a nondescript beast in the dream that Daniel had. But on its head were what? Come on, you should know this. Ten horns. Ten horns. Well, when you look over at Daniel, you see, wait a minute. There were four kingdoms in succession, but then we get to the feet of iron and clay. And it wasn't another kingdom, it was a breakup of Rome in which many kingdoms came. Of course, that was Europe. 
And now we're looking at the ten horns on the head of the fourth beast in chapter number seven. And so notice that we're looking at the same time period. Remember, the feet was the one emphasized the most in Daniel 2. And now we're looking at the ten horns of Daniel 7. Why? Because a new element is introduced for the first time. In chapter 2, it wasn't necessary to tell King Nebuchadnezzar. He was, God was showing him who, how he had, uh, only God knows the end from the beginning. Uh, the wisdom of God is greater than the wisdom of man. But when we get to seven, he's not talking to Nebuchadnezzar. He's talking to you and I. And a new element is in, introduced there. And of course, that is called the little horn, right? The little horn. So let's take a look at the little horn as we look at what the preacher won't tell you about the Antichrist. Take your Bibles, if you would. Turn with me to Daniel, the seventh chapter. We're going to read three places, three places. And while you're turning to the book of Daniel, children, get your Bibles out. Come on. I want the children to follow along in your Bibles. I want you to look at this and realize something. Daniel had a dream, and in three of the elements in Daniel's dream were repeated three times. Not once, not twice, but three times. And God is calling our attention to these three things in particular, and they coincide with the ten toes of iron and clay. And here it is. So let's look at Daniel 7, and we're going to read Daniel 7 and 8. And this is the dream now. In the dream, here's what Daniel sees. And after this, I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the other beasts that were before it. It had ten horns. Now look at eight. Daniel said, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and the mouth speaking pompous words." So please check this out carefully. I considered the horns, Daniel said, and look what he discovered. First of all, another horn, a little horn. Secondly, coming up among them. Now see, God is timing this little horn so we can start to put it together. We need to know who this little horn is. In a second, you'll see why. Number three, three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots in order for this horn to come to power. Number four, it had eyes like the eyes of the man. And number five, it, the mouth speaking pompous words. Five characteristics. Well, let's go to the second reading. Daniel 7, 20 through 21. And the ten horns, I, I just started right there. And the ten horns that were on the fourth beast, that were on its head, the fourth beast's head. And the other horn, which came up before which three fell. Namely, that horn which had eyes and a mouth speaking pompous words. Whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailed against them. Now, notice this. Some of the elements in this new verse 
are repeated again. The ten horns, and among the ten horns is the other horn, before which three were plucked up. It had the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. But two new elements are introduced here. Point six, characteristic six, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. Point seven, making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Okay, what are we doing? Okay, we're taking the focal point of Daniel's dream, this little horn power. We're pulling out the characteristics that God gave to us so we can figure out who the Antichrist is. By the way, all the commentators agree that Daniel 7 is the Antichrist. They don't agree on who it is, which to me is one of the greatest puzzling uh, thoughts that you can't figure this one out when God has made it so plain. Oh, well, let's keep moving. Verse 24 and 24. And then it says, and another shall rise after them. That's the ten horns. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words. And look what's added what? Against the Most High. And shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and laws, and the saints shall be given into its hands for a time, time, and a half a time. All right. So let's look at this again, and we see that some things were repeated. Another shall arise after them, subdue three kings, pompous words against the Most High, persecuted the saints. Okay, so we look at the characteristics of this little horn power that Daniel introduces in his dream to us that Nebuchadnezzar didn't have. And please notice, persecute the saints, that's twice. Pompous words against the Most High. How many times have that been read? How many? Can't hear you. Three times, you're wrong. If you read the chapter, you'll find it's mentioned four times. It's mentioned in another place. This is one characteristic that's mentioned four times. Pompous words against the Most High. And also, uh, I said persecute the saints, pompous words. Uh, subdued three kings, how many times is that? You're afraid now. Right? Three times in, in, those, in verse 8 and in verse 20 and in verse 28, three times that's repeated. It, it caused three nations to be eradicated in order for it to come to power. And then, though, we have two new characteristics, three new characteristics. Number eight shall be different from the first ones shall in, uh, intend to change times in law. And number 10, time, time, and a half a time. That's how long the little horn would reign for. So let's take a look at the characteristics. <sighs> All right. Here they are. Three different locations in one chapter. God made sure that we'd have enough evidence so we can logically put together who the Antichrist is. Another horn, a little one, different from the other ten. Coming up amongst the ten, so about the same time period. Three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. They are eradicated and gone. This has an eyes like the eyes of the man, mouth speaking pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows, making war against the saints and prevailing against them. He shall be different from the first one. He shall intend to change times and laws, and finally reign for a time, time, and half a time. So the question we're asking today is, who is this person? Who is this person? And I'm not going to answer that. Okay? I want you all to follow this. And I want to show you something. 
I'm going to change pages here. This is amazing. Because I want you to know, in the year 991 A.D., there was a Roman Catholic bishop named Arnoff of Orlean who called the Pope the Antichrist of the book of Daniel. I want you to know there was an archbishop of Salisbury named Everhart that in 1240 said, well, this power is the Pope. And then the Waldensians in 1100 said, this power is the Pope. And then John Wycliffe in 1379 said, this power is the Pope. And John Huss in 1412 said, this power is the Pope. And Martin Luther of the Lutherans said in 1522, this is the, the Pope. Philip Melanchthon in 1543 said, this is the Pope. John Knox in 1547, a Scot Presbyterian said, this is the Pope. William Tyndall 1550 said this is a pope. Hugh Latimer, and by the way, I didn't memorize it, but in 1552 he said it, and he was burned at the stake. Along with Ridley, uh, another priest, friend of his, pastor, Sir Isaac Newton in 1727, well, this prophecy is pointing to the papacy. John Wesley of the Methodist, of the Methodist said... This is talking about the papacy. And then, of course, there is Thomas Kramer, Cranmer, Archbishop of Canter Canterbury and, and um, an Anglican who, who was burned at the stake, said this is the pope. John Calvin, the Presbyterian, said, this is the Pope. And then we come to America. And by the way, folks, I looked at a list that was 83 names. This is only 20. Then we come to America, and John Cotton was a, pre was a Puritan minister in Plymouth and Boston, and he said, this is the papal see. And then William... Roger William was the first American Baptist minister who said, this is the Pope. And then Cotton Mather in 1663, well, that's when he was born. But he said the same thing, this is the Pope. I'm looking for something here. Cotton Mather... Cotton Mather was a Congregationalist theologian. And then Jonathan Edwards said, and Jonathan Edwards was a famous revivalist and third president of, president of Princeton. This is the Pope. And then we have Samuel Cooper, and he was a... Um, Listen to this. Samuel Cooper, while delivering a series of lectures at Harvard, said, quote, if the Antichrist is not found, is not to be found in the chair of St. Peter, he is nowhere to be found. I, I, that's what I did. When I read that, I thought, that's cool. That is funny. That's what he said in a lecture at Harvard University, by the way. And then Uriah Smith, Seventh-day Adventist, said, this little horn power is the Pope. All the reformers, and I didn't give you half of them, said, the little horn is the papal seat. And so, folks, we come face to face with this. Now, I gave you this picture because you remember the one thing that was said four times in chapter 7. And by the way, 
This is not easy, okay? My family is still all Catholic. And the Catholic people are wonderful people. In fact, I believe it's Ellen White who wrote, there are more good Christians in the Catholic Church than in the Adventist Church. But we're talking about a system here that is pinpointed by the prophecies of Daniel 7, and we're not done yet. Remember, this is a seven-part series, what the preacher won't tell you about Daniel. And when we're done, I have a nine-part series on what the preacher won't tell you about Revelation. And Revelation in two different places, nail it just like Daniel 7 does. That is the Pope sitting on a great white throne. Where have you heard that before? Revelation 20. Who sits on the great white throne? Who sits on the great white throne? God does. And I, I quoted there for your edification. You go home, you've got to read Isaiah 37, 16, it says that God sits between the two cherubs. Do you notice those gold things between the... Do you understand what that statement is? I'm God. Pompous words against the Most High, folks. Like when I was a, a Catholic, I never understood it. I didn't know any of this. All I knew is what I learned as a boy. I studied the catechism. I never studied my Bible. We weren't given a Bible. There are good people there that we need to reach. But we need to love them because if we approach this topic with anger and hate or, or negatively, we're going to turn them all off. But this is the truth. And you're not going to hear the preachers today talk about this. Why not? First of all, I want you to hear this. We, the Seventh-day Adventists, did not invent this interpretation. Amen? Amen. We inherited it. We inherited it because we're a continuation of the Reformation, and so are the other churches, only they're not talking about this. And it's part of present truth, folks. This little porn power has not changed. And I've got to say that in light of the fact that Pope Francis has won the affection of people around the world for his humility and his care for the poor and everything else, not one doctrine that Martin Luther and all the other churches revolted against, Methodists, Baptists, Congregationalists, Presbyterians, Adventists, not one has changed. They teach the same thing they taught before. You're not hearing the preacher tell you this, even in some Adventist pulpits. Take a look at this. Why? Because it's not politically correct anymore. How sad it is. I, two things happen. I, I got to tell you this. Two things happen. I noticed as I grew up and got older that all of a sudden it came appropriate or even fashionable to criticize leadership publicly and openly. It, I, I'm talking about political people as well as spiritual people. But now, as we do that, it's not correct to judge anyone else or their beliefs or to correct them. You know, don't pick on them. There's no right day of worship. It's whatever you want to do. It's okay. Just so you worship on one day, I hear. The preachers aren't preaching this. Why? Because it's not politically co correct. It goes against our culture. And finally, I've flat out got to say, they do not know prophecy. 
They do not know prophecy. Take a look at this. I forgot something. You see that last picture there? Let's bring it more up to date. Uriah Smith's in the 1800s. Let's go to Rob Bell. Rob Bell. Listen to this. Several American evangelical and fundamentalist theologians, including Cyrus Schofield, have identified the Antichrist as being in league with. Notice this. Not who it is, but being in league with or the same as several figures in the book of Revelation, including the dragon, the beast, the false prophet, and the whore of Babylon. Voices in the emerging church. By the way, the emerging church is the latest thing in Christianity. And I want to tell you from my studies, I couldn't believe it. The emerging church is the new thing now. Rob Bell is one of those voices. And emerging church, what is that? I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what it is. It's a conglomeration of Christianity and New Age. And I want you to go back with me to the third century in 250 when Origen, 250 AD, Origen took Greek philosophy and Egyptian mysticism and combined it with Hebrew tradition. 250 AD. Remember I told you last week, the apostles' graves weren't even cold yet. Here's what Rob Bell said. The, Rob Bell rejects the identity of the Antichrist with any one person or group. They believe a loving Christ would not view anyone as an enemy. Preacher's not going to tell you. And by the way, I, I wasn't being sarcastic or funny when I said even some Seventh-day Adventist preachers, uh, I'll never forget this happened to me personally. I was teaching, and I already told you this one, but I got, it bears repeating. I was teaching the book uh, by Clifford Goldstein on the dragon. Now I forgot the name of it. Sandra Spencer knows what it is. What is it called? Oh, yeah, that's right, 1844 made simple. And, and there was an Adventist man in the church nearby my church, and he said to me, we were doing something together. It was a work bee, by the way, and he said to me, you teaching that book at, in, in your prayer meeting? And I, my eyes got big. I went, yeah, you want to come? You know, like, it's really great. He said, I'm, he said, I don't believe in that book. I said, What? He said, it, it offends my Catholic brothers and sisters. Then I thought, I've got him nailed. I went, well, then you can't give out the great controversy to someone. He said, that's right. I wouldn't give that book to anyone. Wow. Now, brothers and sisters, I wish some of the Catholic people I wish some of the Adventists were like the Catholic people. When they learn the truth, they go for it. They just haven't heard it. But we got Adventists that are fighting against it. What the preacher won't tell you about the Antichrist, they won't tell you that the Antichrist is the papacy. Always has and always will be. And you won't hear it for these various reasons. And by the way, some of you may be sitting there and thinking of reason four and five and six even better than my three. But that's what I came up with. And so I want to give you an example here. Listen to this. I was on the internet and I was reading. And here's what I found. Hippolytus. <laughs> Hippolytus, 170 A.D. Here's what Hippolytus said. He held that the Antichrist would come from the tribe of Dan and would rebuild the Jewish temple on the Temple Mount in order to reign from it. 
He identified the Antichrist with the beast, the beast out of the earth from the book of Revelation. 170 A.D., and do you know that many of the dispensationalists believe that the Antichrist is going to come from the tribe of Dan, rebuild the t- temple, and restart the sacrifices And you just saw the 10 characteristics that tell us who the Antichrist is. But this is is really a good one. All right. Listen to this. So, Daniel 7.25. This is from a sermon I picked off the internet just recently. Is telling us that the Antichrist intends to change time, to change the appropriate, appointed time of a law, decree, edict, statute, or treaty. Where did treaty come from? In other words, he doesn't intend to keep his side of the bargain he makes with the Jews. He's going to break the treaty. And this is exactly what we find happening in future prophecy. Halfway through the seven-year time frame, he is going to break the covenant. By the way, this is dispensationalism. Here we go. Ready? To make it as easy to understand as I can, I'm going to tell you what I believe this verse is telling us. Remember, this is only my infallible interpretation. I may be right, but I may also be wrong. Make up your own mind about this. Here it is. I believe that the Antichrist will be an Arab from the Middle East. He, it's, like, it's highly likely that he will also claim to follow the Muslim faith and probably even be a terrorist. He is going to come from among a coalition of Middle Eastern powers bent on destroying the Jews and taking their land. This coalition of power may be actually actual nations or they may be powers with the Middle East area like a terrorist cell or a terrorist group. The Antichrist plans to accomplish the destruction of the Jews will include making a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews. Show me that in the Bible. Which he never intends to keep. The treaty will probably bring a halt to the terrorist attacks and the bombings so that the Jews will feel like they are living in peace and safety. In exchange for stopping the attacks, the land of Israel and probably even the capital city of Jerusalem will be divided up. But the entire time, but the entire time this evil leader plans on breaking the treaty when he has had enough time to regroup and amass enough warriors and weapons to wage a successful war against the Jews. He intends to change the set time of seven years and break the law, the peace treaty. Dispensationalism. Where do you find that in Daniel 7? Where do you find that in Daniel 8? Next week is part four. And we're going to look at the second witness, what the preacher won't tell you about the second witness of Daniel. That's Daniel 8. Revelation 13 same beast as Daniel 7. Revelation 17, same beast as Daniel 7. Folks, you're not going to hear it from the preachers. Do you know your Bible? Do you know prophecy? Because we're going to be teaching it big time. Not because we're right and they're wrong, but because Jesus wants every one of his children to be there. By the way, I... I'm on, I'm on streaming live here, and other people will see a delayed, te- um, a delayed view. I apologize to my Arab brothers and sisters. That was not my sermon. 
That was his sermon. But how you can get an Arab out of Daniel 7 is amazing. Because they don't know prophecy. My friends, we have a work to do. The kids are coming here next week. They're going to be going door to door. They're going to come up with Bible interests, and we're going to have the pleasure of teaching them what the Bible really says. But we have very little time left. Amen. Father, I want to thank you as you're enlightening us to the real situation that's occurring all around us. And Lord, Satan is trying to make so intense living a life here that it's distracting us from our real purpose. And I pray that you would break that bond and set us all free to work together to reach this community and to understand that we should never say, well, we have the truth. But instead, would you like to know what prophecy says? Oh, Lord, forgive us, but help us. Because you have tremendous Christian people in all other organizations that would give their arm to know what we know. Help us to use it. Bless each person that's here. Let no one be discouraged, Lord. And, and, and can reveal to each one here that you have a plan for them and that you want to use them as part of your army to do this work. So don't let anyone leave here without making a decision, Lord. Send the Spirit to speak now and inform us and encourage us and challenge us so we can step up to the plate and at least get a hit. So bless now to this end, and thank you for hearing this prayer, because we pray in Jesus' name, amen.